Welcome to Language Processing Systems, a talk hosted by PyData Pi Al-Khubar. So I'll talk a little bit about PyData and who we are. We're an educational program of NumFocus, promoting discussions of best practices, new approaches, and emerging technologies for data management, data processing, data analytics, and data visualizations like what we have today. Our guest today is Jay Alamar. Uh, Jay is a machine learning researcher and engineer. Today, he'll be giving us a gentle intro to language models, as well as sharing one of the projects he has been working on lately, Echo. And he had just published it, actually. I believe he'll be sharing some features of Echo for the first time here, actually, so stay tuned. For questions, you can ask them throughout the talk, and Jay will be answering them in the end. Uh, Jay, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, um, Fal. Thank you, Pi Data Khobar. Uh, Let me share my screen. Okay, so this is a gentle, a gentle intro to um, transformer language models, and that this intro is a little bit important to make sense of what Echo is. So, personally, I think language models are some of the most probably the most interesting and fascinating technology out there. Um, I spend so much of my time the last two, three years just thinking about them. And over the last five or six months, I started focusing on them full time. And that's when uh, my exploration about how they work um, it culminated in, in some tools that I put together and I, I released as Echo. So. Echo was, was released last week. Um, it's alpha, it's a research project, it's an open source project that um, I'd love to, to, to share with people and for people to um, contribute to uh, so we can all understand uh, language models better. Um, let me just show you uh, the website of Echo. So you can go to echox.io and that's where you'll be able to see the link to the GitHub uh, page um, and then the article that I used. So I've been doing um, writing and research and Echo came out of that research and um, this blog post is the first in, in a series. Um, I'll be releasing the second one pretty soon at the end of this week or early next week. And then you can see the features that, that um, Echo has, and we will be covering all of these now. And some of them are uh, usability or UX in terms of how you deal with language models, just you know, making dealing with language models a little bit more accessible, uh, a little bit easier for people. But, but some of them are more research oriented um, and tackle things like input saliency and, um, and neuron activations, which are, which are a little bit more research topics, but they're absolutely extremely fascinating. And so we, uh, when we talk about open source, we stand on the shoulders of giants. So Echo relies on a bunch of tools from what's called, what's sometimes called the, the, the Pi data stack. So it's Python, we use NumPy, Jupyter is in there, we use uh, scikit-learn um, and matplotlib. Um, we, I don't use all of these tools, I just use the ones that we mentioned. and. Uh, Echo is also built on top of PyTorch and, and Hugging Face. So this is all open source. This is incredible collaboration of, of, of the community. A lot of it is supported by PyData and, and NumFocus. And so um, I feel a lot of gratitude to anybody who, who donates their time, their efforts to get open source um, in, in improving. Um, and this is um, you know, me thanking uh, all of you. So before we go into it, I'd like to make this a little bit more accessible to maybe also engineers who haven't worked uh, with language models uh, before. So I have a, a, a short example that I use to introduce people to um, machine learning. So uh, machine learning is, is not magic. And I use this, a small uh, basic example to, to uh, illustrate that to people. So imagine that three people walk into an ice cream shop um, and we want to learn how much, uh, or we want to predict how much they would end up paying. Uh, 
so this is a question that you can't find the answer to just by looking in a business book or having an MBA. Uh, this is an, a question we can probably answer with data. And so to answer that, we look at the previous, let's say, three um, transactions that happened in this uh, ice cream shop. The first one had a group of one person who end up, ended up paying $10. The second one, second transaction was a group of two people who ended up paying $20. The fourth, the third is a group of four people who ended up paying $40. Now, we want to predict what three people would pay, but we don't have data. We've never seen a group of, of three people walk into this ice cream uh, shop before. But is there anything we can glean? Is there anything we can learn from the data that we have that enables us to make that, that prediction? Um, if you can make that prediction based on this data set, you can type the answer in the chat. Okay, yes, so 30, 30, 30. Yes, everybody's, uh, so I have three people or four now saying that is 30, exactly. So what you did there, that is the central idea for machine learning from the, this is one of the most basic examples, but everything we're going to be talking about from Alexa to Siri to Google Translate to even GPT-3, this is the central idea around all of that. They just take it one step further, or two steps and three steps, and they keep extending it. And so this gives us a little bit of, of, of the language to, to speak about machine learning. And so what you did is that you found a secret number that explains the relationship between these two columns. We have the column on the left is called our features. That's the, the, the input into our model. Uh, the red or pink column is called the labels. That's the data associated with the value we want to predict. And then this we can call a labeled data set. This is the historical data set that we use to make the prediction. And then we have the weight below. And so this is the most one of the most basic uh, machine learning models. Uh, it, training it is just finding the number 10. So what you just did is, you, you, let's say you did the training. Um, and then to make a prediction, you just give it the input. So three, you just multiply uh, three by 10 and then 30, that's, that's the prediction in the end. So this is the simplest machine learning model. This is the simplest neural network as, as well. It's a neural network of just with one weight, which is um, 10. And so training a model is just finding the right parameters to make, to make that prediction. So data in the real world is not as friendly. We don't have this clean pattern of everybody walking into the ice cream shop actually paying $10. Um, so in the real world, you'll find that you know, three groups, each with uh, you know, one individual in the group, one would buy for zero, one would buy for $20, one would buy for, for, for five. Um, and so, it's difficult to make predictions in a case like this. So we can extend um, our, our example to say, okay, can we use more features? And so we can break our example into saying, what if we have a group of two adults and one child, and they walk into an ice cream shop, how much would they pay? And in this case, we have, let's say, four examples, and we have two features now. It's not just the one column, we have the two feature columns. Um, and so we have, Let's say the first one is one child paid $5. The second transaction is one adult paid $10. Uh, the third transaction, one adult, one child paid $15. We've never seen this group of two adults and one child, but can we make that prediction? Um, can, if you can figure it out, you can type it in the chat. Um, Twenty-five, twenty-five. Yes, that is correct. Exactly. So. You just trained another model in, in, in your head, another simple model. And that model associates a weight for each column. And then it says, okay, 10 times two plus one times five, um, and that's 25. And so that's, this is a, a neural network, let's say, of two weights. So this is a little bit more um, sophisticated. So, and so on and so forth. If you have more features, more columns, uh, you can make better predictions. And so ins instead of just the number of people, you can talk about the temperature, the time of day, so on and so forth. So the relationship between features and labels um, can be easy or it, it can be complex based on the data, based on what you want to predict. And so we have a list of 
different types of models that we, we can use to, to, to make predictions. Uh, these are some examples uh, from them. Uh, what we'll be addressing more here are, are towards the bottom, which is neural networks. Uh, there's, there are some examples of, of neural networks. Um, RNNs used to be with a lot of natural language processing uh, was, was using. Uh, the transformer model has uh, been uh, eating up NLP. Uh, and sort of dominating most of the tasks um, in NLP. And now it's also doing, it seems to be doing that for computer vision as well. So when we talk about language modeling, we can think about um, a feature and, and label uh, data set kind of like this, where uh, one example is that if we say Shawshank, we want the model to predict redemption. Because you know the Shawshank Redemption is the the famous movie and story, um, and uh, yeah, great movie. Um, it, there aren't many words that usually come after uh, redemption, and so if a model predicts this, um, it's it's good. And so, language models are trained on data that is scoured from the internet. So we get all of Wikipedia, we get um, data from 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 elsewhere, and we break that into examples and then we train a model against that and you'll see that there are some features that like good um a label can be morning and could, could also be evenings because good morning is is a commonly used phrase good evening is a commonly used phrase another way where language makes this a little bit more advanced is that we're not talking about just one number or two numbers um, a word is not one input into a model a word is usually broken down into what is called an embedding. And so a word is represented by a, a vector or a series of numbers. And we have methods uh, to turn um, words into, into embeddings. And I can refer you to my blog. There's a post called the Illustrated Word of Vec about the model from about 2013 uh, that became very popular. Um, so this is a way for, for you to if you haven't uh, been exposed to um, word embeddings, uh, this is probably a good introduction. To it. So when we talk about language uh, models and um, NLP has been doing incredible things. We, it might be, it's surprising. So if you time travel somebody from a thousand years ago and you know, you bring them to this age, they would probably be surprised that we are talking to devices and we're talking to things and these things are talking back to us. So we talk with Google and Siri and Alexa and, 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 and Cortana and that's incredible technology. A lot of it, has, a lot of us have gotten used to it, uh, but, but it's, it's absolutely amazing when you, when, you, when you think about it in just the context of, of history. Let me show you, let me, let's uh, take an exercise, an example. Um, I'm gonna say a word, and in the chat, I want you to try, try to predict what word I'm saying. Um, so this is just a, an example for how language models can be helpful to technologies like, like Siri. So the word is principle. What do you think that word is, is spelled like? Can you type in the chat? Principle. Okay, so perfect. So we have two um, two answers, and these are the two answers. So we have principal P L E, and we have principal P A L, and they're they're pronounced the same. And if you're the engineer building Siri, and that's what that's the only word that Siri heard, there isn't really much uh, you can do. But what if you heard it in in context? That's something a language model can, can really help you with. So what if it's not just a, word, a standalone word? What if, if it was preceded by these, let's say five words? It was a matter of something. So this is the thing that language models can, can, can help us with in terms of really telling us what is the probability of this word uh, coming next or, or the other word coming next. And with that, I will switch to a notebook um, that I will be sharing with you later where we can start to see how Echo can be helpful in those, in those cases. So, can you see my screen? Is the text readable? 
Okay. Perfect. So when you want to use echo, you just do pip install echo. It's on uh, PyPy and then you import it. And then what this does is it creates a language model. It downloads a trained, a pre-trained language model from the hugging face uh, package. And so if you have never used a notebook before, these are just cells of code that we can execute by, by just pressing shift enter. Um, and this is uh, running in, in, in Google Colab, so you don't need to set up your, your environment. So here we just load a, a pre-trained language model. So this is a language model that has already seen a lot of text and it was already trained and it knows a little bit of, of English. And so with echo, we say, this is the input. It was a matter of, we pass this to echo and we say, okay, generate one word for us. This is generate one token or one word. And uh, we want to save that as output. And so when we run this cell, it goes to the language model and the language model says time. It was a matter of time. So unfortunately, it's not principal or principal. We don't know which one yet. Um, but we can do another thing uh, in, in Echo. We can say, okay, this, so this is a view of Echo that shows you the input and broken down into the tokens um, that the language model uh, saw. And we can see that the output position is number five, right? So there's zero, one, two, three, four, and then this is five. So we can say, use echo to say, okay, in position five, what are their options? You outputted time, but to produce time, you must have ranked uh, the probabilities for so many words. And so if we run this uh, cell, Echo would create this visualization to say, okay, at layer, layer five, which is the end of the model, the token time had 16% probability. That's why it shows it. But then there are other possibilities. Could have been, let's say, it was a matter of the, or it was a matter of fact, or it was a matter of a. Uh. So these are all possible um, tokens that, that, that could have, could have come um, as, it, as the completion uh, in that blank. It could have been faith, and then that, there is principle, P-L-E. And so this is the one that is, you know, it's, it's ranked, ranked seven. And so what a language model does here is, a language model has, knows about 50,000 words, this one, uh, distill uh, GPT-2. And what it really does is that it gives a probability score to each word that it knows. Um, and they, here they add up to, um, to one. And so then we can, if we're generating text, we can just select the, the highest probability word, or we have other methodologies of what it, what's called decoding. These are decoding strategies. Another thing we can do uh, to explore this using Echo is to say, okay, let's um, get the token IDs of the two words that we're interested in. And so these are the two numbers of, of, of token IDs and I plug them here. And this is another method in, inside of Echo um, that will be in the blog post that I'll, that I'll be publishing. And this compares principle with principal. So it was a matter of blank. And then in this, what word could have come in this blank? Principle was at the end of the model, it was ranked number seven. So it was the seventh highest ranking word. But this one principle, PAL, was 1,600. Uh, so it was not even close. So the model is, is fairly certain that it is principle like this. So this is a graph that you can uh, use to see what words um, that you're interested in um, could have been filled. Um, this is matplotlib and seaborn on top of it. Um, so yes, this is a, a seaborn heat map with, with some, um, and hello Vincent, uh, tweaking and the, the, the color, um, there's some tweaking for, for the color um, here and how that's uh, shown. And so this is um, just a, a quick look 
um, at uh, overview, let's say, of echo. And we, we'll go back, but we'll talk about language models a little bit more and then, and then come back. And so this is um, a, a visual of what we can say um, we did with the model. We, so we presented this, uh, these four tokens, it was a matter of, to a, a transformer and um, it goes through the layers and we, we, we get the output afterwards. And so that's, that's the demo that we, the quick demo that we just uh, went into. Um, I'm, I understand the, the importance of things by looking at applications. And I wanna talk about uh, applications of, of language models um, that are probably around you. So let's say you go to Google to search something. Let's say you search, you're interested in, in Siri and Siri's technology and you search for Siri tech and then you have uh, your, your recommendations kind of like this. And then you have a search result kind of like this. So this is, these are just for screenshots for me from my phone. And you click on this uh, search result and then you have uh, the, the result highlighted like this. I don't know if you've come across this highlighting yet, but it's, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's uh, I can see it now. So which one of these steps do you think um, uh, uses a, a language model? Um, if you can post that in the chat, I would. So step one is searching. Step two is the, the search result. And step three is the actually uh, clicking on, on the result. So which of these three steps, if you can type in the chat, which step do you think used a language model? All, all, all three? Okay, so this is pretty unanimous that, that all three have used language models. And you're actually correct. So it's not just three. Um, I kind of tricked you here. It's there are f about at least five usages of language models here. So the the suggestions that Google is is presenting to you that's most likely something like a language model. The suggestions the autocomplete by the keyboard is the most used language model that all of us use hundreds, maybe thousands of times a day. This is also an application of language models. The highlighting is another one. There's a, a step 1.5 between one and two that also uses um, uh, language models. Ah, bold words, that's probably also. Uh... So, okay, so now we have six uh, uses. Um, so the first one is autocomplete or predicting the next word that is, is, is using language models in step one and step two, this um, summary is a summary, let's say, of, of the uh, Wikipedia page. So that's text summarization that uses, um, I can assure you that it uses transformer language models to do this. Um, the highlighting is question answering. Um, and so that's another technology that uses uh, language modeling. Highlighting the, the words is probably, it could be a language model, but it could be also just um, string matching. Yes, the first one could be a character level language model. There, there's a step 1.5 between them that right now Google is using BERT in all of its uh, search results. And so when you submit a, a, a query in all of their English, uh, when you submit a query, they use a language model to try to not just search for the words, but the meaning behind the words. And this is an example from a post that they've um, published before, uh, where if somebody searches, 2019 Brazil traveler to USA before using BERT they would give you this answer on the left where it has all of the keywords but it's somebody traveling to Brazil not to USA but then after using BERT search is now able to uh, understand let's say quote unquote the meaning behind the, the sentence a lot better and the quality of search has, has improved um, uh, a, a lot better uh, than just matching keywords and strings. 
if you use uh, Gmail, you've probably come across these suggestions um, at the bottom, uh, which are response selection. And this is a, a technology or a use case of, of um, language models that you can also find in conversational agents as a whole, uh, be it Siri or you know, chatbots, things like Raza, all of that is response selection. Um, and that is definitely based on, on language models. So this is just to say that language models are all around you. You either realize it or I hope you're realizing it now. Um, and they're really changing the landscape of, of you know, what technologies are, are being able to. So I, I think it's a very important uh, tool in the toolbox of any engineer to really try to understand what language models are doing and how they work. Um, a word on training a language model. Uh, what is most commonly done now is a two-step way of, of training these models. And so we can do pre-training, uh, which is uh, language modeling, which is just predicting the next word. So we get a lot of text from the, the internet and we train a model to be able to predict that next word. Once we do that, the model turns out to encode a lot of knowledge about the world and knowledge about language. And then we can take it a little bit more training to fine tune it to uh, be able to, to solve a different task. Um, a word on pre-training. Uh, so this is uh, an example of uh, training, let's say, or pre-training the model in the beginning. So we give it uh, three words and we know what the completion should be. Uh, the model is not trained, so it will uh, output a you know, junk uh, result. We know that it's wrong. We can calculate how wrong it was. We back propagate that. So this is the, the loop of machine learning and training models uh, as a whole. And so we do this thousands of times, um, and then we have a, a trained language model. And that's this, the first step of, of pre-training. Once we do that, it's just training it for a little bit more for it to be able to solve one of the other problems. Okay, so that's a quick overview about applications of, of, of language models. Um, let me show you a couple of things that I thought were interesting while, while exploring um, some language models. So I said that lang language models not only capture uh, language, but they also capture some, some world knowledge. So if we tell a language model uh, to complete this sentence, if we say Heathrow Airport is located in blank, would it be able to um, really guess that we wanted to say London um, or not? So we can ask it to generate you know, five words or five tokens, and it would say it's at the heart of the city. Well, we can't say that this is a wrong answer. Uh, it's, it's perfectly acceptable. Unfortunately, it's not what we were looking for, what we were trying to probe. So we can say, okay, let's change our, our input prompt a little bit to say Heathrow Airport is located in the city of, um, and will that be able to really probe the model to give us a, a city or not? And so we ask it to generate one word. And here it says, is located in the city of London. So this is you know, a successful um, question. Is, it is, is it based on the data that the model is trained on? Yes. So this is a, a pre-trained model trained on a lot of data uh, collected from, from the internet. And you, just, you don't need to train it. You just download it and you can play around with it um, and explore it. Generate five on the second. So yes, that is a request from the chat. You can generate five and Echo would show you. So it's just London, period. So let's send it back to one and because I want to show you something else. So we, we saw the predicted words in the previous example. What other predictions are, are possible here for London? So London is the first or top uh, token with 13%. But it could, all, could also have, been, have said Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow, Edinburgh, all cities know this, and all, all British or UK um, or English uh, 
cities in England and around England. You can change this top K to say, you know, if you want to look, because the model has already scored 50,000 words. Uh, so you can say, okay, show me maybe 30 different uh, predictions. You will, you will get some from Ireland, Westminster, and then you get these partial. So the models are not only outputting words, they can also output tokens, which are part of words. So it can be same or in something else. And you can see the ranking of each token, but also the um, probability that the model has scored. So another thing that's also interesting is um, rankings. So if you uh, tell the output just to output to rankings, uh, this model we said is six layers. The top, the, the, the last layer is the one that ranked London first. So we can see throughout while the model was processing um, this input, what each layer ranked the token London as. And so at the end of layer zero, it was um, ranked 800. And layer one is 270. So you can see the layers are slowly elevating the ranking and the probability of the word London until the last uh, layer really says that, okay, this is the answer. And we just pick the top one as, as our. Um, and so a lot of this uh, type of visualization is inspired by this incredible blog post uh, called Interpreting GPT, the, the Logit Lens uh, by uh, the Nostalgibrist. I don't know, we have a name for um, him or her. Um, so check that out. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, and a lot more will be coming about this in, in the coming, um, upcoming blog post. Uh, one thing here is, since we're talking about uh, completion, let me see what my next slides are. Okay, yes, we're good. So th this, I love this um, prompt uh, and giving it to GPT. Let's say the countries of the European Union are new line one dot Australia, two Belgium, three Bulgaria. So. I want, before asking this or seeing the output of the model, there are a few questions. Can the model continue, I understand that there's a list and continue numbering it correctly? Can it follow the same formatting that, that we used here? And then is it able to actually name countries and European ones? Um, and will it notice that they are alphabetical or not? And so this is the, the prompt and we tell the model to generate 20. And we ask it to sample, so not just to pick the highest um, scoring uh, token. So Echo will show you the output as the model generates it. And so this is where the output starts uh, at the arrows. And so the model is saying, okay, Croatia, New Line, Five, Denmark, Estonia, Finland. So you can see the numbering is continued. The periods are, are there. It's the same sort of formatting. It is, this is C, D, E, F. It is also alphabetical. These are all countries. And uh, it's, it's stopped. So that's, that's 20 tokens. And so that's, you know, this is, this is still the GPT model. And I like this because it, it, it shows, you know, a few things and we'll, we'll get into uh, that a little bit. I showed you the ranking for London here. So we can actually see or graph the ranking for all of the tokens that the model output. And that's what we'll do here. Is that not beautiful? So look at the patterns here. There are some, some columns that are generally pink and that's the new line um, and the, the period. So, from layer zero, um, the model very early on realizes what this output token should be like. So the earlier layers are able to notice that, okay, yes, now we're gonna output a new line or, or, or a period. For the numbers, so this is five, this is six, this is seven, they tend to be resolved at around layer three. And then the layer four really elevates that token. So you can say that Maybe layers three and four really are the ones that um, have a sense of which numbers come after each other. And 
it's easy to be to confuse yourself to by thinking that the model knows numbers the model just knows tokens uh, so it just knows that five is probably um, a token that usually would come after four you can see that the the words the um, actual list items the country names are usually resolved towards the end they need a lot of the models um, let's say representational capacity to be able to be resolved um, we chose one in almost all of them but then here we chose the fifth highest ranking one which was denmark um, that is because we said do sample here so it, it just picks based on the probability it picks from the top 50 uh, tokens and it just gives us interesting results this way um, and so this is the type of visualization that I that I really love and it just tells you about about the, the various um, layers uh, and you can take that to bigger models and smaller models and different kinds of, of, of input and, and to look at that so a lot of this is, is um, based on the incredible work by, by the nostalgia boost. So one of the main features in, in the literature of, of um, explainability and interpretability in machine learning, uh, this input saliency is, is one thing that is, uh, is used. And so we can uh, use that or have a view for that here. What this says is that the darker the color is of, of, of the, the token, the more that token had, uh, we attribute that to um, the outputting of this token. And so when the model was creating Croatia, the tokens that had the most, um, let's say, attribution to actually generate that token are Bulgaria and Austria, um, and maybe the countries. So I was thinking about, about, about countries. Um, you can, this is an interactive uh, visualization, so you can, go here and see the new line is the new lines are usually uh, the model focuses on the token preceding it to maybe get the, the sense that the word is, is done or, or complete. The numbering the model looks at the generally tends to look at the previous numbers and the previous list item. So this is a simplified view and then you can also have the, the detailed view that will show you um, exact numbers. And so when you're moving over the names of the countries, you can see that these um, lines, these, let's say, call them spark bars, um, are indicating that the list items is, are the ones most responsible for the model generating this um, output. The same thing with the numbers, the model sort of uh, attributes this to, to, to looking at the previous numbers. And when you're on the new lines, it's, tends to always, almost always look at the previous um, token. So th this can be overlapped a little bit with, um, with attention. And uh, um, I'm working on things that sort of um, compare and contrast uh, input saliency to, to attention. And so this leaves us with one um, last major feature uh, in ECHO to discuss, but, but before we do that, um, we need to uh, just introduce a little bit more of, of detail about uh, the models. So a transformer language model, we showed that it's, it has a number of, of decoder blocks or layers. Um, and we, we saw the model with six layers. Uh, the, each layer has two major components and each of these components has, we can say, a general role. The first major component is the feed forward neural network. And that is the, the, the component that is able to generally tell or encode what words tend to come after previous words. And so when we say Shawshank, the feed forward neural network is the one that is going to uh, predict that probably redemption is, is, is the following word. So this is the one major component of, of the decoder layer. It's not the only one, but the other one is self-attention. So we looked at this example in the beginning, it was a matter of. So if we only had a feed for neural network, uh, it will only be able to tell us what words usually come after of. Um, and that would not always be helpful because that does not have context. Self-attention is able to bake um, the representations and the understanding and the meaning of all of the tokens. Um, before uh, the word that we're currently processing. And so these two working together, they're the ones 
that, that empower these transformer layers. And they're the ones that empower incredible applications like GPT-3 and, 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 and BERT and everything we see in, in NLP these days. And so these are the two major components. There's a lot of work visualizing self-attention or attention. Um, so I, I haven't uh, done much of that. I have some ideas and some things that I might roll out in the future. Uh, but I would like to refer you to Expert. Um, it's an incredible um, visualization portal where you can input some tokens and choose a model and it will visualize uh, self-attention for you. So that I did not work on, but I did work on uh, the feed-forward neural network. And that's our last uh, view that we'll, we'll be looking at. Uh, if you'd like a little bit more understanding about the components of the transformer, I'd love to uh, refer you to my blog post, The Illustrated Transformer. And with that, we can do our demo of amateur brain surgery. And this one you can find here. So this is the notebook that we'll, we'll be going over. So it's in the echoax.io, and then you can click on this collab and it will open up the notebook for you and you can start experimenting with it right away. And I don't know if I ran this before, but what this does is install Echo. I did not yet write a, there's a question that did I write the paper that presents the library? Not yet, I'm doing that right now. Right now it's, it's a blog post, uh, but there's hopefully gonna be something uh, a little bit more formal. So we've installed Echo and then we can download the model. So you can also try different models by the way. So you can, this can also be maybe GPT-2. Um, for, for a bigger model with, with different uh, results. And so what this does is this would download the, uh, the Hugging Face be trained model. It's about 300 megabytes. And then we have this text that we present to the model and we say, just generate one token because we don't really care about what you're gonna generate. We just want to understand your um, react to this text. And so here the model is um, processing this. It outputs some token, but we don't really um, care about that. It says so. So now what we have is, so outputs now has a variable called activations that stores all the activations of the neurons inside the feedforward neural network. And it has the, this shape. And so the model has six layers. And so that's the first dimension here. Each layer of the still GPT-2 has 3,072 neurons. And the length of this text is 354, um, let's say, uh, tokens. And so this is the activations, um, vector here. You can visualize it. I think I still have some, some visualizations um, methods uh, for activations, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a little noisy. So one incredible way to shrink down that noise and get some signal out of it is to do um, dimensionality reduction using something called non-negative matrix factorization. And that's what we do here. It says, okay, take these activations and break them down into 10 components. There's a question here from Vincent, I gotta ask, what front end are you using here? Is this custom D3 rendered as HTML in the notebook or are they IPy widgets? This is um, D3, custom D3 rendered as HTML. So Echo is actually two things. It's a Python library, but it's also Echo.js, a JavaScript library. They're separate repositories, both are open source, and it uses both, both of them uh, to actually output, output these. And so this is the, the output of um, exploring this to, to the 10. And here we can see, um, you know, it, it broke down six times 3,000 is about uh, 18,000 uh, neuron activations um, into 10 
different factors. The first factor highlights this. So there tends to be neurons uh, that focus on the word that and though. Um, a second factor, a second pattern in the activation uh, tends to be, let's see, I'm running out of rhyme a little bit. Okay, he, he, man, really. So this is one way to, to, to look at this. What I really love is this, when we look at the, only the first layer. So we can say, okay, break it down into 10 components and these uh, neurons of the first layer, let's try to find uh, the underlying um, patterns in, in their activation. And that's what we have here. So we have, there are groups of neurons that tend to activate towards the middle of the text, um, which is very interesting because these tokens, they don't really have a signal um, about their location, uh, except for the, the pos positional encoding. And so that really tells us about neurons that are um, sensitive to potentially to uh, positional encodings. And we have three of these. So we have a factor for the middle, we have a factor towards the end, and we have a factor towards the beginning that focus on various uh, part, uh, parts of the text. We have a factor that says that of neurons that all only focus or focus very intently on the first token. And this is common to GPT. It is less of a factor in, in BERT, but I echo so far only uh, focuses on uh, uh, GPT for now. But then look at this. Do you see a pattern in these words highlighted by factor number five? Uh, these are all pronouns. These are all maybe, let's say commas, but this is, you know, punctuation. But here you're starting to see some, some linguistic properties that are being able to, uh, we're split, splitting out um, from the activations of, of, of the models. And so this is will, would, shall, um, and other verbs here, um, are, is, and so you can, you can change the, the number of components. You can try less or, or more. And I'd, if you anything you, you find interesting, I'd love if you post it to, to the discussions. But this is one of the earlier um, places where I, uh, I've been looking. And so this, I think this concludes uh, my talk. Uh, let me see if I uh, can address some of the questions. Um, let's see. Okay, yes. So, uh, please remind me if I've missed any of the questions previously. So I see, will it be useful to create everything from scratch for intuition or high level idea for that concept would work? I'm not understanding exactly. So I find it useful to just use a pre-trained model so you don't have to train your own model. Um, Hugging Face makes that a lot easier, but you can try bigger models. I don't know if that answers uh, your questions. Um, you, can, you, can, you can elaborate on, on, on the question. Um, Vincent, about the front end, uh, it seems to incrementally update. Is there also a server running, uh, sending data to uh, JavaScript. So, yes, um, every time the model gen, so there are, there are two updates. Um, I can so these updates are all on on JavaScript. So the Python backend has given j the the JavaScript package everything that it needs, all the tokens or their activations. So all of this shifting here happens on the JavaScript side. Um, when you're outputting um, a token kind of like this, um, a, the Python sort of backend keeps invoking the, the JavaScript and say, oh, we have a new token, display it. We have a new token, please display it. Uh, Lex is asking, will it guess the alphabetical order for countries in reverse? I'd love for you to try that and let me know on Twitter. Um, and uh, I'm intrigued to, 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 to uh, learn that. Amrit um, is asking, how can we use input saliency for some of the downstream um, NLP tasks? So uh, the, one of the best tools that people can use now is Captum. Uh, it needs a little bit of, of, of work and I'm working on 
um, a way to try to do input saliency for BERT and, and maybe some, some downstream. But it's, it's, it's not, not, not that difficult. It's just back, propagate, back propagating the gradient and then just multiplying it by the, um, let's say, the input uh, embedding. Uh, so it's it's kind of one line, but it's it's that that back prop. Um, but for now, maybe the best tool to do that is is Captain C A. In the example listing in the countries in the EU, what mechanisms prevents answers from being repeated? That is a great question, and that is why I told them the model to uh, do sample is uh, true. So if we say false. It will always choose the highest ranking token, just number one. And that would tend to make it less interesting, I would think. We tend to repeat Czech Republic, uh, but it will probably wouldn't, yeah, see, uh, it just repeats it. But if we say, if we set this to true, see, it just repeats. I mean, still continuing to count, but. And then if we plot the rankings here, you'll see the difference between the two is that it's always selecting the top one. And so check is one, 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 one. Uh, while here it's more interesting because it was able to select the fifth token. Um, Vincent, are there updates going from JavaScript to Python? No, no, it's all one way so far, I think, yes. Um, one question, next word prediction result already in the training set. Um, yeah, so the, the training set is uh, extracting a lot of next word prediction examples uh, from real world uh, texts. So that's, that's the language modeling uh, task that these models are, are trained on. Uh, what are the libraries um, same to you? Um, so I, I link to a number of uh, NLP visualization uh, uh, libraries in, in the blog post. I think that's probably the best um, resource. A captain does saliency. Um, there's a bunch of them based on, so expert I've already mentioned. Um, and then Captum has some, some visualizations as well. Countries in the Pokemon Union. I don't know, give me something and I'll, I'll plug it into the model. What problems of AI do you think Transformers has shown significant um, progress in? Um, I assume knowledge representation because of their ability to represent and recognize entities and abstract concepts and relate them with each other. So um, in the beginning, um, Transformers were used because they can be trained in parallel um, in a way that is um, a lot easier to do than RNNs. But then with time, they were able to dominate the, the let's say, the, uh, the benchmark or set top the, the charts in, in every different task. So they're able to train large models um, on vast amount of data. And the, the bigger you keep the, you make the models, the more they will, they will learn. Um, and so that's, that's a little bit of why they, they tend to be used. Um, would this NMF reduction method work for other types of input sequences of data token uh, speech? Uh, yes, I can see why not. And I'm interested to try other ways of, of uh, re dimensionality reduction. I first started out with PCA, uh, but with PCA, it's difficult to interpret the negative um, dimension of PCA. Uh, but the NMF is, 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 is pretty fascinating. Would this also support language models trained on mask language modeling objective like BERT and not autoregressive models like GPT? I'm working on that. So that's hopefully in the roadmap. It's, uh, it's not supported yet. To what extent can ECHO allow us to explain why a language model has made a particular prediction increase the interpretability of such a model? So, it just provides a couple of, of, of tools um, that you know, one could, could add to their toolbox. It's not the, the only uh, one out there and it's still a sort of a research project. 
Um, so yes, saliency is an explainability method, um, but I, I'm also interested to, to explore uh, neuron activations for that as well. We have the NMF uh, projection visualization of the contextual latent space in three dimensions for an intuitive understanding. Um, yes? I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot we can do um, with that. I haven't wrapped my head exactly around, around this use case, but, but let me uh, think about it a little bit. Can the visualization highlight biases in coding in the language model? Yes. Thank you for answering this. I have an example, but I don't know if I have it out. So, um, okay, we'll do this live uh, and we'll maybe close with this. So you see this visualization, uh, we can use this to maybe probe for um, bias in language. So we can say uh, the text is, um, The doctor was, uh, and then we wanted to generate a token. And I don't know if you can see what's going to happen here or not. The doctor was a doctor. Okay, yeah, sure. That's why not. But then we can use this kind of. Uh, probing to say, okay, give us the man and woman tokens. And then watch out for these two tokens. How did they rank, I guess? Nope. Yeah, I'll put one. Okay, so we need to change the position. Position here is four, so this will be four. And so we can see the doctor was um, a man, the word man in all of the layers had a higher ranking than, than woman um, as the word to fill in this space. But then we can say the nurse was a, Okay, this was a nurse, then we don't need to change this, but then the visualization here would say, the nurse was a woman ranked higher than man here. It, was, it ranked number eight, while man did 22. But that only happened at the last uh, layer. Every layer before ranked man before or higher than, than woman. So this is a kind of way to sort of explore uh, biases that I found interesting. I think that concludes it. Um, thank you very much. Please check out Echo. Let me know how I can improve it. You're welcome to uh, help me uh, improve it. Thank you.